Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on the gastrointestinal tract. In this video, what we're going to talk about is uh, chronic gastritis, uh, which means uh, inflammation of the stomach wall, okay? And we're also going to discuss uh, peptic ulcers, okay? So, and peptic ulcers, because chronic gastritis can lead to the formation of peptic ulcers, okay, which are a similar concept to acute gastric ulcers, uh, except for the fact that they are chronic, okay, so they uh, remain for an extremely long period of time, and they cause um, abdominal discomfort, uh, feelings of sickness, and sometimes even vomiting, and occasionally they can cause um, you to vomit up blood, basically. The, those are the risks that uh, this chronic peptic ulcer can lead to gastric bleeding, and even worse, occasionally it can actually lead to complete perforation of the stomach wall, which is a surgical emergency. But we'll get to all of that later. Okay, so, uh, before we can discuss the uh, pathology, uh, we need to first understand the anatomy and the physiology. So we're firstly going to discuss the anatomy of the stomach, the gross anatomy. Then we're going to discuss the microanatomy. We'll discuss the histology of the stomach wall. Uh, then we'll talk about the physiology of gastric acid secretion and the regulation of gastric acid secretion, and then we'll talk about uh, chronic gastritis due to uh, infection by the bacterium Helicobacter pylori. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll move on to how chronic inflammation with um, well, chronic infection with this Helicobacter pylori can lead to chronic ulceration of the stomach wall, which is a peptic ulcer, and then the uh, complications that this can lead to. Okay, so, and then finally we'll conclude with the treatment of uh, peptic ulcers. Okay, so, we'll start off with the gross anatomy of the stomach then. So, let's start by drawing the esophagus here. Okay, and then the esophagus leads into the stomach, which I'll draw like so. Okay, so it curves around like so, and then you have the duodenum here. I'll just complete that. Right, so let's do some labelling here. So, this uh, tube that leads into the stomach, this is the esophagus. Okay, and I'm using the um, British English spelling of esophagus where you have this silly O in front of the E. Uh, the American English spelling omits this O, and if um, you prefer the American English spelling, just re replace, you know, just drop the O. Okay, right. Uh, then you have a special sphincter between the esophagus and then uh, the entrance to the stomach. Okay, and I'll colour this um, sphincter in, in blue here. So in blue, this sphincter is meant to represent the gastroesophageal sphincter. Okay, uh, so it's between the esophagus and the stomach, so the gastroesophageal sphincter. Okay, now, uh, a sphincter is just a thickening of the circular smooth muscle that surrounds the esophagus, okay, and this uh, circular smooth muscle can contract, which causes constriction of the rings of smooth muscle, and therefore narrowing of the lumen, and therefore it effectively acts as a gate, closing off the uh, junction between the esophagus and the stomach, okay, so this is the gastroesophageal sphincter. All right. Uh, now we're into the stomach here, okay, and the stomach is divided up into four main portions, basically. So let's start off with the fundus, okay? So we'll start off with the fundus, which is this portion right at the top. Now, fundus means the portion that is furthest away from uh, the entrance, basically. Now, you might think, well, why on earth is this bit that I'm colouring in orange at the moment the portion that's furthest away from the entrance? Because it's not. It's close to the uh, entrance to the esophagus here. But basically, we're talking about the pyloric sphincter down here into the duodenum as the entrance, basically, if you like. So um, this is the portion that's furthest away from the pylorus. Okay, so... And this is the fundus. 
Right, uh, the next important portion that we have is this little portion here just after uh, the gastroesophageal sphincter. This portion uh, here that looks as though it's still part of the esophagus, but actually it's part of the stomach here. Okay, and we'll highlight this in uh, purple. Okay, and this is known as the cardia or the gastric cardia. Okay, so this is the cardia. Okay, of the stomach. And then you have the main portion of the stomach, which is the body, okay? So this portion here is the body of the stomach. And I'll highlight this in red, okay? And then underneath the body, uh, you have uh, the antrum, which then leads on to the pyloric sphincter. So I'll put the pyloric sphincter here. So we have another thickening of the circular smooth muscle that surrounds um, the stomach. And basically, this is going to form a sphincter between the stomach and then the beginning of the small intestine here, which is the duodenum. Okay, so this here, this is the pyloric sphincter. Okay, and then in between the uh, body of the stomach and the pyloric sphincter, this portion here is then called the antrum of the stomach or the gastric antrum. Okay, so I'll colour in the antrum in, I think, turquoise. So we therefore have these um, four portions, the fundus, the body, the uh, cardia, and the antrum. Okay, right. And these divisions are important because, as we'll see, it's the body of the stomach that is mainly responsible for secreting um, hydrochloric acid, okay? And it's the antrum of the stomach that's mainly responsible for secreting gastrin, okay? But we'll come back to that later. Now, a few more little anatomical terms. Uh, this portion here, this aspect of the stomach here, which I'm now highlighting in purple, this is known as the greater curvature of the stomach. So this um, curved um, aspect of the stomach here that is the large aspect of the stomach, this is known as the greater curvature of the stomach. Okay? Uh, and this smaller portion here, this curve in here, this is then known as the lesser curvature. Okay, so I'll colour this in in, tur well, not turquoise, I've used turquoise already. I'll colour it in in green here. Okay, so in bright green, that is then the lesser curvature of the stomach. Now, where is my arrow? Where was it meant to be? This is what my arrow, I think, was anyway. <laughs> right, so um, this is the lesser curvature here in green. Okay, so those are terms that you will often hear anatomists use, the greater curvature of the stomach and the lesser curvature of the stomach. Okay, so there's a little bit of anatomy. Uh, now let's do the histology of the stomach wall. Okay, so let's begin from the luminal side, okay? So if I was the little man standing in the lumen of the stomach, looking at the stomach wall, what would I see? Okay, well, I'd see an image that looks like this. So let's just draw what you would see if you were a little man standing in the lumen of the stomach. Well, basically, firstly, you would see uh, structures known as rugal folds, okay? And basically, these are folds in the um, wall of the stomach, which evaginate out, basically, okay? So if you imagine little ridges, okay? So what you'll have is the little ridges called rugal folds, and all, and well, and the direction in which these ridges are uh, propagating is down towards the pylorus. So all over the surface of the stomach, you have these ridges uh, that e evaginate out into the lumen of the stomach, and these will run down towards the pylorus, okay? And these are known as the rugal folds. Now, also what you will see on the surface of the stomach is little pits, okay? So you'll see little invaginations into the wall of the stomach, okay? And these are known as gastric pits. So this is a gastric pit. Okay, so that's the macroscopic um, things that you would observe. You'd see these little uh, pits into the wall of the stomach, and you would most definitely see the rugal folds. Okay, now what we're going to do is imagine uh, taking a pair of scissors and cutting the wall of the stomach and then looking at it in cross-section, okay? So we can imagine cutting across like this and we're now going to look at the um, structure of the wall in cross-section. 
Okay, so basically, what you would see is something that looks like this. Okay, so basically, you'd have the um, layer that faces into the lumen, and then basically it would invaginate down to form this gastric pit. Okay, and then from the gastric pit, you have further invaginations. So I'll show these here. So you have one invagination and then another invagination like so. Okay, and you'll have multiple invaginations from the gastric pit. And then it comes back up, and then we've got the um, epithelial cells which then face into the lumen and are on the surface again. Okay, right, so this portion here, which I'm now shading in blue, this is known as the gastric pit. Okay, so this portion in blue, this is the gastric pit. Okay, and then from the gastric pit, we have further invaginations uh, downwards, and these are called the gastric glands. Okay, so these portions in here, which are now highlighted in, I think, orange, uh, these are called the gastric glands, or another name for the gastric glands is to call them the oxyntic glands. So, gastric forward slash oxyntic glands. Okay, right. Now, now we've got those little invaginations of the surface sorted out, let's actually discuss uh, the cells which line the lumen of the stomach. So basically you have a simple columnar epithelium lining uh, the lumen of the stomach, okay? So I will now um, draw these simple columnar epithelial cells. Okay, and basically, uh, these simple columnar epithelial cells are going to have the job of secreting mucus onto their surface to protect them from the extremely uh, acidic environment of the uh, stomach lumen. Okay, right. So, uh, the columnar epithelial cells which are uh, on the surface, okay, so these ones here, the ones that don't line a gastric pit, so not these ones down here which line the gastric pit and then the gastric glands, but the ones that are actually on the surface looking into the lumen, okay, whereas these ones are looking into the gastric pit. Yes, they're in contact with the lumen, uh, but these ones that are actually facing into the lumen, these are known as the surface um, epithelial cells or the surface mucus cells and uh, they also have another name Ooh, whoops surface mucus cells okay so the other name for this type of cell is to call it a foveolar cell okay so these are also called uh, the foveolar cells so you will occasionally hear foveolar cells used to describe these surface mucus cells or these surface columnar epithelial cells. Now, uh, the epithelial cells which then line uh, the gastric pit, which I'm now drawing, and also the gastric glands further down, these instead are called neck uh, epithelial cells or neck mucus cells, uh, but their job is essentially the same. They secrete uh, the mucus that they will put on their surface basically to protect them from the extremely high, uh, sorry, the extremely high proton concentration but extremely low pH environment uh, within the lumen of the stomach. Okay, so I might as well complete this drawing now and separate out all of this as separate cells because we're nearly there. Okay, right, so I've finished separating out my separate epithelial cells. So these ones here, then, are called the neck mucus cells, okay, and they would not be called foveolar cells. Okay, so neck mucus cells. Right, uh, so let's discuss, then, what these uh, surface mucus cells and these neck mucus cells are doing. Well, they're secreting mucus, okay? So let's show this mucus that will be lining their surface, okay? And the purpose of this mucus is to protect the cells from the extremely high uh, proton concentration, free proton concentration within the lumen of the stomach, and also to protect them from the protease enzymes which are in the stomach. So later what we'll see is that there are cells within these gastric glands which are secreting um, 
well, precursor to pro precursors to protease enzymes, and these precursors to protease enzymes will be activated in the lumen of the stomach, and they are then very, very dangerous and can digest cells down. So, uh, these uh, surface epithelial cells, they need to have protection from that, and therefore they're going to coat themselves with the mucus. So the mucus will protect them not only from the uh, acidity of the um, lumen of the stomach, but also uh, the protease enzymes which are in the lumen of the stomach. Now, they don't just put mucus on their surface, they also put a special ingredient into this mucus, and we'll discuss this special ingredient now. So basically these uh, foveolar cells, or also the neck mucus cells do this as well, it's not just the foveolar cells, okay, uh, they secrete bicarbonate onions, okay, and the formula for bicarbonate onions is HCO3 minus, okay, now let me show you the structure, the molecular structure of bicarbonate onions, basically you have a carbon atom at the centre, and then from that you have a double bond to an oxygen atom, and then you have an alcohol group coming off this carbon, like so, and then the final oxygen is single bound to this carbon, but that leaves this oxygen non-saturated, okay, so it's still got uh, one free electron. It's now got seven outer shell electrons, including the one that it's sharing from this carbon, uh, but it needs one more to take its outer shell electron number up to eight. So it acquires that by ionic means, and that gives the whole molecule a negative charge. Now, this molecule is fantastic uh, because it's a base, basically, uh, which means that it's capable of uh, binding free protons. So, basically, uh, these um, columnar epithelial cells are secreting this mucus onto their surface. They're then filling this, filling this mucus with bicarbonate anions. And basically, if protons do uh, leach through the mucus from the lumen of the stomach, then what will happen is those protons will be neutralized by the bicarbonate anions. So basically, protons combined to bicarbonate anions to create an intermediate, which is carbonic acid, and then the carbonic acid can go on to break down into water and carbon dioxide. Okay, so this is carbonic acid here. So basically, all that's happened is a proton has come here, and then the oxygen's provided two electrons into a covalent bond here, uh, which then neutralizes the charge on the oxygen atom and also the positive charge on the hydrogen atom. Okay, so this is carbonic acid here. Right, uh, okay, so that's uh, a way that these um, columnar epithelial cells can protect themselves from the high free proton concentration in the lumen of the stomach, because if any of the free protons do leach through, they won't actually get to the cells, instead they will react with these bicarbonate anions, which are sitting within the mucus. Okay, so we'll call it there for this video, and continue our discussion in the next video.